Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, Namaskaram. I'm Dr. Vijay Sagar, Professor and Head of the Department of Anatomy at the Sri Ramachandra Medical College and Research Center at Chennai. In this lesson, I will be talking about the knee joint. First, a few words about the clinical anatomy of the knee joint. As you know, the knee joint is a weight-bearing joint. And as all weight-bearing joints, it is prone to osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis primarily results in destruction of the articular cartilage and manifests as severe pain, swelling, and restriction of movements. While the initial forms of osteoarthritis can be treated with lifestyle changes and simple analgesia, advanced forms of osteoarthritis invariably will require a total knee replacement. The knee joint has a large number of synovial fluid filled sacs which are called bursae all around the joint to facilitate movement of the ligaments and tendons. Inflammation of these bursae causes bursitis which results in severe restriction of joint movements. The knee joint is intrinsically an unstable joint and it is supported by a large number of ligaments which are both intrinsic as well as extrinsic. Violent injuries as sustained during sports and motor vehicle accidents cause destruction of these ligaments and repair of these ligaments involves a substantial amount of physiotherapy and rehabilitation. MRI and arthroscopy are diagnostic procedures which allow one to see and visualize the structures within the knee joint. There is something called as the Q angle or the quadriceps angle which is essentially the angle between the long axis of the thigh and the long axis of the line of gravity. Variations in the Q angle results in conditions like genu verum, which are commonly called as bow legs, and genu valgum, which are the knock knees. With this basic introduction, let us proceed on to the knee joint as such. The knee joint, if you see, has articulating bones which are formed by the lower ends of the femur and the upper ends of the tibia. In this particular picture, you see the lateral femoral condyle articulating with the lateral tibial condyle, the, lateral, the medial femoral condyle which is articulating with the medial tibial condyle and you have the patella which is articulating with the lower part of the femur or the or lower end of the femur. This is the articular surface and the lower end of the femur. The anterior part shows a flattened area for the patellar articulation. The central part again shows a flattened area for tibial articulation in extension. And the posterior part shows a rounded area for tibial articulation in flexion. So let us now have a look at the uh, lower end of the femur and see these same structures again. This is the femur and this is the lower end of the femur. You can watch this. This is the articular surface. This articular surface articulates with the patella, whereas this is the flattened articular surface which articulates with the tibia in extension. And if you look closely, this rounded area of the femoral condyles articulates with the tibia in cases of flexion. The knee joint is a bicondylar complex synovial joint. It's complex because there are intra-articular discs and it's bicondylar because the condyles of the femur, that is the medial and lateral condyles of the femur, articulate with the medial and lateral condyles of the tibia. The articulating bones are the lower ends of the femur, the upper ends of the tibia, and the patella. If you see in the joint, there are three articulations which happen within one knee joint. There are the lateral and medial femorotibial joints which are bicondylar in variety and the femoropatellar joint 
which is a saddle type of joint. Functionally, the knee joint can be called as a modified hinge joint with primary movements as flexion and extension and a small amounts of medial and lateral rotation are also possible at this joint. Please note that the fibula does not take part in the knee articulation. The knee joint is intrinsically structurally weak. It is primarily because of two reasons. The first reason is that the articular surfaces are not fully congruent with each other. It is like two balls which are present on an uneven table. The two femoral condyles sit on the flat platos of the upper end of the tibia and are intrinsically unstable. It is like two balls which are sitting on an uneven table. The second reason for the structurally weak aspect of the knee joint is because of the Q angle angulation that is 11 to 14 degree angulation which exists between the axis of the thigh and the axis of the leg. Now this intrinsically weak knee joint is structurally strengthened by five sets of ligaments. There are five sets of ligaments which are extrinsic and there are five sets of ligaments which are intrinsic. So there are 10 ligaments which reinforce the strength of the knee joint. And there are additionally, there are expansions from the tendons and ligaments which reinforce the joint capsule. The knee joint has a large number of bursae to facilitate movements of the tendons. If you look at this picture, this is the lower end of the femur with the lat medial condyle of the femur here. The, media, the lateral condyle of the femur here articulating with the lateral condyle of the tibia and this is the medial condyle of the tibia. You note that these two bones are held together by a large number of ligaments which are both intrinsic and extrinsic. Extrinsic ligaments are those which are located outside the joint capsule and reinforce the capsule from the outer aspect. Intrinsic ligaments are those which are located within the joint capsule. In this particular picture, you can see the patellar ligament, also called as the ligamentum patellae, which is an extrinsic ligament. You can also make out a lateral ligament, which is also called as the lateral collateral ligament. It's also called as the fibular collateral ligament. This is an extrinsic ligament, which strengthens the lateral aspect of the joint. There is a similar ligament on the medial side that is called as the medial collateral ligament. It's also called as the tibial collateral ligament again an extrinsic ligament which stabilizes the joint on the medial aspect. If you look closely at this picture, there are two ligaments within the joint capsule. These are the cruciate ligaments which strengthen the joint from the inner aspects and you can also main identify this rim of fibrocartilaginous tissue. These are called as menisci which act as cushions and shock absorbers between the femoral condyles and the tibial condyles. We will have a look at the extrinsic ligaments first. The extrinsic ligaments include the capsule or the capsular ligament along with its synovial membrane, the ligamentum patellae, the tibial and the fibular collateral ligaments, the oblique popliteal ligament and the arcuate ligaments. These are the extrinsic ligaments which reinforce the capsule from the outer aspect. As opposed to this, there are the intrinsic ligaments which are located within the joint cavity. These include the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments, the medial and lateral menisci, the transverse ligament, the coronary ligament, and the meniscofemoral ligaments. First, we will look at the capsule and the extrinsic ligaments. Capsule is a fibrous structure which joins the bones. Extrinsic ligaments, as we just now discussed, are located outside the joint capsule. Extrinsic ligaments reinforce the joint capsule and strengthen it from all the sides. The capsule is attached to the lower end of the femur. On the anterior aspect, the capsular attachment is to a triangular area just, beho just beyond the articular margins. And you can see at the upper part, there is a gap in the attachment of the capsule. This gap is for the extension of the suprapatellar bursa. If you look on the lateral side, the capsular attachment skirts the articular surface and the attachment of the tendon of popliteus is within the joint capsule. Coming to the posterior aspect, the capsular attachment is on a line just above the intercondylar fossa. 
this is the line of the capsular attachment on the posterior aspect. So to summarize, anteriorly the capsule is attached to a triangular area at the lower end of the femur beyond the articular margins. The attachment leaves a gap superiorly for the passage of the suprapatellar bursa. Laterally, the attachment skirts the articular surface and includes the tendon of popliteus on the lateral condyle. Posteriorly, the attachment is just above the intercondylar fossa. So this is the attachment of the capsule on the lower end of the femur. Now let's have a look at the attachment of the capsule on the upper end of the tibia. If you see on this particular picture, the capsular attachment is to a triangular area just beyond the articular margins. This is the tibial tuberosity and this is the line of the attachment of the fibrous capsule. On the posterior aspect, the attachment is just beyond the articular margin and over the lateral condyle of the tibia, there is a gap for the passage of the tendon of popliteus. This is the muscle popliteus. The muscle extends upwards and laterally and the tendon passes through the gap in the capsule to get inserted into the lateral condyle of the femur. Now the popliteus is a very important muscle which we will review subsequently. It is responsible for a very important action of unlocking of the knee joint. So to summarize, the capsular attachment on the tibia, the capsular attachment surrounds the articular margins of the tibial condyles. Anteriorly, it is attached to the triangular area on the upper end of the tibia and blends with the ligamentum patellae. Posteriorly, the capsular attachment shows a gap over the lateral condyle of the tibia for the passage of the tendon of popliteus. As you all know, the synovial membrane lines the inside of the joint capsule. The synovial membrane reflects from backwards anteriorly and forms a double-layered fold and backward extension which is called as the infrapatellar fold. On either side of the infrapatellar fold, there are two backward extensions of the synovial membrane again and these are called as the LR folds. From here, the synovial membrane reflects backwards and from the posterior aspect, it runs forward as a double fold of synovial membrane which encloses the two cruciate ligaments. So if you see these two cruciate ligaments, they are located outside the synovial membrane. This double layered fold of synovial membrane is called as the intercondylar septum. Now again, if you look closely at this picture, there is a gap between the infrapatellar fold and the anterior end of the intercondylar septum. This gap is called as the intercondylar foramen. The synovial membrane, as we just now discussed, lines the inner surface of the capsule. It covers parts of the bone within the capsule, excluding the articular surfaces, and seizes at the margins of the menisci. The synovial membrane envelops the cruciate ligaments and the tendon of popliteus. The intercondylar septum, as, as we have seen in the picture uh, in the previous slide, the intercondylar septum is a double fold of synovial membrane which encloses the cruciate ligaments. The infrapatellar fold is a small double layered backward extension of the synovial membrane below the patella and LR folds are small double layered backward extensions of synovial membrane lateral to the infrapatellar fold on either side. This picture shows this double layered fold of synovial membrane extending forwards. This is the intercondylar septum. This is the anterior gap in the intercondylar septum and this is called as the intercondylar foramen. This is again a picture which is showing the reflection of the synovial membrane when seen from top. What you see here are the upper aspects of the tibial con uh, condyles and this is the infrapatellar fold. The synovial membrane reflects backwards, comes onto the posterior aspect of the condyles and extends forwards as a double layered fold. This double layered fold is called as the intercondylar septum. And if you notice, there is a gap between the infrapatellar fold and the anterior end of this intercondylar septum. This is called as the intercondylar foramen. So that is about the synovial membrane. Now we shall have a look at the other ligaments, which are the extrinsic ligaments of the knee joint. The first ligament, which we see here, is the ligamentum patellae. The ligamentum patellae 
is derived from the tendon of the quadriceps femoris. It ex extends from the apex of the patella till the tibial tuberosity and it has got two bursae which are related to it. These include the subcutaneous and deep infrapatellar bursae. We will again have a look at this bursae when we study the bursa in relation to the knee joint. The ligamentum patellae receives two small expansions from the vastus lateralis and the vastus medialis and these two extensions are called as patellar retinacula. The ligamentum patellae reinforces the joint capsule from the anterior aspect. This is a picture showing the ligamentum patellae which has been reflected down. This is the cut tendon of quadriceps femoris. The patella has been reflected down to show the ligamentum patellae which is getting attached to the tibial tuberosity. Now we come to the two important extrinsic ligaments. These ligaments are the collateral ligaments. There are two sets of ligaments. On the medial side, we have the medial collateral ligament and on the lateral side, we have the lateral collateral ligament. Now I want you to have a look at this particular picture. You see this ligament extending from the lateral epicondyle of the femur to the head of the fibula. This is the fibular collateral ligament, which is a thick cord-like structure and it is overlapped by the tendon of biceps femoris. It is holding the lateral ends of the condyles of the femur and the tibia together. And note that the tendon of the popliteus, which is getting inserted into the lateral condyle of the femur, runs between the fibular collateral ligament and the lateral meniscus here. On the other hand, if you look on the medial side, there is a ligament which is extending from the medial condyle of the femur and is extending down onto the medial aspect of the tibia. This is the tibial collateral ligament. It is also called as the medial collateral ligament. Whereas the fibular collateral ligament is a rounded cord-like structure, the tibial collateral ligament is a flattened structure and is weaker than the fibular collateral ligament. The tibial collateral ligament as it runs down divides into two parts a superficial part which blends into the capsule of the knee joint and a deep part which is attached to the medial meniscus. Again, if you compare onto the lateral side, the fibular collateral ligament is separated from the lateral meniscus by the tendon of the popliteus, whereas the deep part of the tibial collateral ligament is firmly attached to the medial meniscus. So let us have a quick review of what we have studied. The lateral collateral ligament is a cord-like structure. It runs between the lateral epicondyle of the femur and the head of the fibula. It is overlapped by the tendon of biceps femoris. The tendon of popliteus separates it from the lateral meniscus and the lateral collateral ligament is stronger than the medial collateral ligament. Morphologically, the lateral collateral ligament is regarded as the primitive origin of a muscle called the peroneus longus. Again, you see the lateral collateral ligament here extending between the lateral epicondyle of the tibia and the head of the fibula. It is overlapped by the tendon of biceps and the tendon of popliteus intervenes between the fibular collateral ligament and the lateral meniscus. On the medial side, you have the tibial collateral ligament, which is also called as the medial collateral ligament. It is a flat band-like structure. It is weaker than the fibular collateral ligament Lower down, it splits into two parts, a superficial part which blends with the joint capsule and the deep part which is firmly attached to the medial meniscus. So the medial collateral ligament is a band-like structure with the apex attached to the medial epicondyle of the femur. Lower down, dividing into two parts, a superficial part and the deep part. The superficial part is blending with the lower part, part of the joint capsule and the deep part is attached to the medial meniscus. It is weaker than the fibular collateral ligament and the medial collateral ligament morphologically is regarded as the expanded tendon of adductor magnus. Now let's have a look at the functions of these collateral ligaments. The collateral ligaments reinforce the joint capsule on the outer aspects. They are taut during extension and give tremendous amount of stability to the knee joint. When taut, these ligaments do not permit rotation at the knee joint. And when the knee is in flexion, the ligaments are relaxed and allow a certain amount of rotation to be possible at the knee joint. 
the range of medial rotation is much less as compared to the range of the lateral rotation. The next set of ligaments which we see are the oblique popliteal ligaments. What we have seen so far are the ligamentum patellae is the ligament which is strengthening the anterior aspect of the joint capsule. You have two ligaments at the sides, the medial collateral ligament and the lateral collateral ligaments which are strengthening the joint capsule on the lateral aspects. Now we come to the posterior aspect and primarily there are two ligaments which strengthen the posterior aspect of the joint capsule. These include the oblique popliteal ligament and the arcuate ligament. So let's have a look at the oblique popliteal ligament first. If you see in this particular picture, this is the tendon of semimembranosus. From the lower end of the tendon of, sem tendon of semimembranosus, there is an upward, backward and lateral extension which forms the oblique popliteal ligament. The oblique popliteal ligament is attached to the lateral part of the intercondylar line of the lower end of the femur and strengthens the posterior aspect of the joint capsule. The oblique popliteal ligament reinforces the posterior part of the joint capsule. It is a recurrent expansion from the tendon of semimembranosus. It extends upwards and laterally from the posterior surface of the medial condyle of the tibia to the lateral part of the intercondylar line of the femur and blends with the posterior surface of the fibrous capsule and forms the floor of the popliteal fossa. It is pierced by a set of vessels which include the medial genicular vessels and nerve and the genicular branch of the posterior division of the obturator nerve. So that is about the oblique popliteal ligament. And now we come to the next extrinsic ligament, which is the arcuate ligament. If you notice in this particular picture, this is the styloid process on the head of the fibula. You notice this ligament extending upwards and arching medially and blending into the oblique popliteal ligament. This particular ligament is the arcuate ligament and arches over the popliteus tendon. This ligament strengthens the posterolateral aspect of the joint it originates from the styloid process of the, of the fibula, arches superior medially over the tendon of popliteus and blends with the joint capsule and the oblique popliteal ligament. The presence of this ligament is inversely related to the presence of the fabula. You might know that the fabula is a sesamoid bone which is present in the lateral head of gastronemius and if the arcuate ligament is present, usually the fabula is not present and if the fabula is present, the arcuate ligament is usually less prominent. Both the fabula and the arcuate ligament provide posterolateral stability to the knee joint. So with that, we come to the end of the extrinsic ligaments. So let's have a quick review of what we have studied so far. We have seen that the knee joint is a bicondylar joint. It's, there are three articulations which happen between the condyles of the tibia and the femur, that is the medial condyle of the femur articulating with the medial condyle of the tibia, the lateral condyle of the femur articulating with the lateral condyle of the tibia, and the patella articulating with the anterior surface of the lower end of the femur. Functionally, this joint can be called as a modified hinge joint with primary movements of flexion and extension, and small amounts of medial and lateral rotation are also possible at this joint. We have seen the various extrinsic ligaments which include the joint capsule, the synovial membrane. We have seen the forward extension of the synovial membrane which is called as the intercondylar septum and the gap between the intercondylar septum and the infrapatellar fold which is called as the intercondylar foramen. We have seen that the ligamentum patellae strengthens the anterior aspect of the joint capsule. We have seen that the two collateral ligaments, the medial collateral ligament and the lateral collateral ligament, strengthen and reinforce the lateral aspect of the joint capsule. And there are two ligaments which reinforce the posterior aspect of the joint capsule, which include the oblique popliteal ligament and the arcuate ligament. Now we have a look at the intrinsic ligaments of the knee joint. The intrinsic ligaments are located inside the joint capsule and stabilize and support the articulating bones. The two important intrinsic ligaments include the cruciate ligaments and the menisci. In addition to the cruciate ligaments and the menisci, the other intrinsic ligaments include the transverse ligament, 
the coronary ligaments and the meniscofemoral ligaments. By far the most important ligaments for the knee stability include the cruciate ligaments and the menisci. First we will have a look at the cruciate ligaments. The cruciate ligaments are so called because they cross each other like an X. They are named as per their attachment on the tibial plateau. For instance, if you look this at this particular picture, the anterior cruciate ligament is attached to the anterior aspect of the intercondylar area of the tibia. Similarly, the posterior cruciate ligament originates from the posterior aspect of the intercondylar plateau of the tibia. One or the other ligament, one or other of the two cruciate ligaments is taught during all positions of the knee joint. For instance, the anterior cruciate ligament is taught during the position of extension of the knee joint and the posterior cruciate ligament is taught in the position of flexion of the knee joint. The anterior cruciate ligament from its origin on the anterior aspect of the tibial condylar plateau extends upwards, backwards and laterally and is attached to the medial wall of the lateral condyle of the femur in the intercondylar fossa. The anterior cruciate ligament has a relatively poor blood supply and its main functions are that it binds the bones together, it is taut in extension, it prevents hyperextension and anterior displacement of the tibial condyles on a fixed femur. It forms the very important vertical axis for femoral rotation during extension and flexion. If you look at this picture, this is the attachment of the anterior cruciate ligament which extends backwards, upwards and laterally and is attached to the lateral wall of the intercondylar fossa. This is the attachment of the posterior cruciate ligament. It extends upwards, forwards and medially and is attached to the medial wall of the intercondylar fossa. The posterior cruciate ligament is less oblique as compared to the anterior cruciate ligament. As I mentioned previously, it is directed upwards, forwards and medially and is attached to the lateral wall of the medial condyle of the femur in the intercondylar fossa. As the anterior cruciate ligament, the posterior cruciate ligament also binds the bones together. It is taut during flexion and prevents hyperflexion and backward displacement of the tibial condyles on a fixed femur. The posterior cruciate ligament is stressed while walking downhill and while walking downstairs. Now we look at the structures which are attached on the intercondylar area of the tibia. In the anterior aspect, the structures which are attached anterior to posterior include the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, the anterior cruciate ligament and the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. On the posterior aspect, from anterior to posterior, the attachments include the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, the posterior horn of the medial meniscus and the posterior cruciate ligament. You can remember these attachments by the use of two simple mnemonics. On this side you have MCL and on this side which have LMC. We used to call it Medical College Lucknow and Lucknow Medical College. You could use your own terms. M stands for the anterior horn of the medial meniscus. C stands for the anterior cruciate ligament and L stands for the anterior horn of the lateral, uh, horn, lateral meniscus. Similarly, on this side, L stands for the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, M stands for the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, and C stands for the posterior cruciate ligament. We now come to the next important set of structures within the joint. These are the menisci. The menisci are fibrocartilaginous structures which act as an interface between the tibial condyles and the femoral condyles. If you see on the upper aspect of the tibia, there are two menisci. This is the medial meniscus and this one is the lateral meniscus. If you see the medial meniscus, the medial meniscus is more or less oval as compared to the lateral meniscus which is more or less circular in shape. The anterior horn of the medial meniscus is thinner as compared to the posterior horn of the medial meniscus while on the lateral side, 
the anterior horn and posterior horn of the lateral meniscus are almost of the same size. The upper surface of the meniscus is concave to receive the femoral condyles, whereas the lower surface is flattened. The outer surface is thickened, whereas the inner surface of the, both the menisci are sharp. Now, if you look closely, the menisci are attached to the tibial condyles by small ligaments which are called as the coronary ligaments. The coronary ligaments connect the lateral aspects of the menisci, both the menisci, to the tibial condyles as well as to the fibrous capsule. So, we will just review what we have just now learnt. There are two menisci, a medial meniscus and a lateral meniscus. The menisci form an incomplete partition in the joint cavity and divide the joint cavity into a menisco-femoral and menisco-tibial compartments. The menisci is made up of fibrocartilage. Anterior and posterior horns of the menisci are attached to the intercondylar area of the tibia by ligaments. The upper surface of the meniscus is concave and the lower surface is flattened. On a cross section, the menisci are wedge shaped with a triangular base towards the periphery and a thin and sharp area towards the center. Each meniscus has a ligament which is attached to it. The medial meniscus has the deep part of the tibial collateral ligament attached to it as we have seen in the earlier part of the lesson. And the lateral meniscus also has a ligament attached to it which is the menisco-femoral ligament. Now, we will look at the menisci one after another. The medial meniscus is semilunar in shape. It is an elongated C-shaped it is longer anteroposteriorly as compared to the lateral meniscus which, has, which is more or less circular. The anterior and posterior ends are firmly attached to the intercondylar area of the tibia. The anterior horn is narrow as compared to the posterior horn. The outer margin of the medial meniscus is attached to the capsule via numerous small coronary ligaments and the medial meniscus is relatively more fixed than the lateral meniscus. The deep part of the tibial collateral ligament is firmly attached to the medial meniscus and the medial meniscus is therefore more prone to injury. As compared to the medial meniscus, the lateral meniscus is more or less circular in shape. Both the anterior and posterior horns are equal in width. The posterior horn gives attachment to a ligament which is called as the menisco-femoral ligament. As we have studied in the earlier part of the lesson, the tendon of popliteus separates the lateral meniscus from the lateral collateral ligament. The lateral meniscus is more mobile than the medial meniscus and hence is less prone to injury as compared to the medial meniscus. Now we come to the functions of the menisci. The menisci essentially increase the concavity of the tibial condyles and they act as shock absorbers in protection of the articular cartilage. They help in distribution of the synovial fluid and help in the complex movements of gliding and angular rotation of the uh, femoral condyles on the tibia. The menisci derive their nutrition from two sources. The peripheral part of the meniscus derives blood supply from the capsular blood vessels whereas the inner part of the meniscus derives its blood supply from the synovial fluid via diffusion. So far, we have discussed two important intracapsular ligaments, which are the menisci and the cruciate ligaments. Now, let us go on and see the other intracapsular ligaments. The third intracapsular ligament is the coronary ligament, which attaches the peripheral margins of the medial and lateral menisci to the tibial condyles. So far, we have seen two important intracapsular ligaments, which are the menisci and the cruciate ligaments. Now, we will look at the third set of intracapsular ligaments, which are the coronary ligaments. The coronary ligaments are small ligaments which connect the peripheral aspects of the menisci to the tibial condyles as well as to the joint capsule. The next intracapsular ligament is the transverse ligament. If you look at this picture, there is a li ligament which is connecting the anterior parts of both the medial and the lateral meniscus. This is the transverse ligament. 
It extends between the anterior horn of the medial meniscus and the anterior margin of the lateral meniscus. We come to another important ligament, the meniscofemoral ligament. The meniscofemoral ligament, if you see in this picture, this particular Y-shaped ligament is called as the meniscofemoral ligament. And if you see closely at this picture, the meniscofemoral ligament is Y-shaped and the, the stem of the Y is attached to the posterior aspect of the lateral meniscus. And this Y, the stem of the Y, divides into two limbs, an anterior limb and a posterior limb. The anterior limb goes in front of the posterior cruciate ligament, while the posterior limb passes behind the posterior cruciate ligament and is attached to the medial wall of the intercondylar fossa. This meniscofemoral ligament has an important role in the anterior gliding of the lateral meniscus during extension. This meniscofemoral ligament has an important role in the anterior gliding of the lateral meniscus during extension. So we will quickly review what we have seen. The meniscofemoral ligament connects the posterior part of the lateral meniscus to the medial femoral condyle. It's a Y-shaped ligament. The anterior part of the ligament or the anterior limb is also called as the ligament of Humphrey, whereas the posterior limb is also called as the ligament of Risberg. The anterior and posterior limbs pass in front and behind the posterior cruciate ligament and are attached to the medial wall of the intercondylar fossa. The meniscofemoral ligament regulates the forward movement of the lateral meniscus during extension. So that is about the intracapsular ligaments. So we'll have a quick review of the intracapsular ligaments. These include the two cruciate ligaments, the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. We have seen the menisci which are two in number, the medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus. We have seen the differences between the medial and the lateral meniscus. Then we have studied the coronary ligaments, the transverse ligament and the meniscofemoral ligaments. Now we come to the synovial bursae which surround the knee joint. Synovial bursae are fluid filled sacs which are lined by synovial membrane. Synovial bursae facilitate movements of tendons and they may or may not communicate with the joint cavity. If you look at this particular picture, this is the suprapatellar bursa, which is an upward extension of the joint cavity. The suprapatellar bursa is in communication with the main joint cavity. In front of the patella is a small bursa, which is called as the prepatellar bursa. Below the patella, this is the ligamentum patellae. There are two bursae related to the ligamentum patellae as we have seen in the earlier part of the lesson. This one here is the superficial infrapatellar bursa which is superficial to the ligamentum patellae and this one here behind the ligamentum patellae is the deep infrapatellar bursa. On the posterior aspect, there are bursae which are related to the medial head of gastronemius and another bursa which is related to the lateral head of gastronemius. The bursa under the medial head of gastronemius is in communication with the joint cavity. On the posterior medial side, there is a large bursa which is called as the anserine bursa, which is a bursa under the tendons of sartorius, gracilis and semitendinosus. Yet another bursa is present underneath the tendon of semimembranosus and another bursa is present under the tendon of popliteus. The semimembranosus bursa and the popliteus bursa are in communication with the joint cavity. There is yet another bursa under the biceps femoris. All these bursae which are present all around the knee joint help in smooth gliding of tendons and muscles during the movements of flexion and extension. Now we come to the relations of the knee joint. On the anterior aspect of the knee joint is the ligamentum patellae. On the lateral side, you have the tendon of popliteus, which is located within the joint cavity. Look further laterally, and this is the fibular collateral ligament. Posterior to the fibular collateral ligament, the fibular collateral ligament is overlapped by the biceps muscle. On the posterior aspect, between the biceps and the lateral head of gastronemius is the common peroneal nerve. 
This is the lateral head of gastronomius underneath which is the plantaris. In the central part on the posterior aspect are the tibial nerve and the popliteal vessels. On the posterior medial side, we have the medial head of gastronomius, the semimembranosus, then the sartorius, gracilis and the semitendinosus. On the medial aspect is the tibial collateral ligament and within the joint capsule, of course, we can see the lateral meniscus and this is the medial meniscus. This is the attachment of the anterior cruciate ligament. This is the attachment of the posterior cruciate ligament and this is the transverse ligament. And of course, the menisci are connected to the lateral margins of the tibial condyles and the fibrous capsule by the small ligaments which are called as the coronary ligaments. We will now study the blood supply of the knee joint. The knee joint is primarily supplied by the genicular branches of the popliteal artery. The popliteal artery, as you know, is the downward continuation of the femoral artery through the hi hiatus in adductor magnus. The popliteal artery, as it passes through the popliteal fossa, gives five branches which are called as the genicular branches. These branches include the superior medial branch, the superior lateral branch, the middle genicular vessels, the inferior medial branch, and the inferior lateral branch. Now, these five genicular branches have a rich arterial anastomosis with branches which are coming from the femoral and the tibial arteries. There is a rich anastomotic network around the knee joint which provides for collateral circulation in case of blockage of the circulation. If you look at this picture, this is the superior lateral genicular artery, which is a branch of the popliteal artery, the superior medial genicular artery, the inferior lateral genicular artery, and the inferior medial genicular artery. These arteries anastomose with the descending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral artery on the lateral side, the descending genicular branch of the femoral artery on the medial side. The popliteal artery divides into the anterior tibial and the posterior tibial arteries. The anterior tibial artery comes onto the anterior aspect through the gap in the interosseous membrane. The anterior tibial artery gives the anterior tibial recurrent artery which goes upwards and anastomoses with the circumflex fibular artery and it, it also anastomoses with the inferior medial genicular artery. Okay, to summarize, the anastomosis around the knee joint is formed with the five genicular branches of the popliteal artery with anastomosis from above which includes the descending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral artery and the descending genicular branch of the femoral artery. This anastomosis is joined by two branches from below which include the anterior tibial arteries branch which is the recurrent branch of the anterior tibial artery and the circumflex fibular artery, which is a branch from the peroneal artery. Coming to the nerve supply of the knee joint, we all remember the Hilton's law, which states that any nerve which crosses a joint gives two branches, one branch to the joint and one branch to the skin overlying the joint. The nerves which cross the knee joint include the tibial nerve, the common peroneal nerve, and the posterior division of the obturator nerve. The tibial nerve gives three articular branches which include the superior and inferior medial genicular branches and the middle genicular nerve. The common peroneal nerve gives two genicular branches which are the superior and inferior lateral genicular nerves. The posterior division of the obturator nerve also gives a genicular branch to the knee joint. We now study the important movements of the knee joint. As we have discussed earlier during the lesson, the knee joint is a modified hinge joint with the primary movements being of flexion and extension and with adjunct movements of medial rotation and lateral rotation. The active movements are flexion and extension and the adjunct movements are those of medial and lateral rotation. The line of gravity passes in front of the knee joint and the range of flexion is fairly large the knee can be flexed backwards to a degree of 120 to 140 degrees. Now, there is a very important concept 
called as the locking of the knee joint. In the erect posture, the knee joint gets locked in such a way that muscle energy is expended and no effort is spent on maintaining the knee in extension. This is the process of locking of the knee joint. During the process of locking, all the ligaments are taut except the ligamentum patellae. Locking is a mechanism by which the femoral condyles rotate medially on a fixed tibia. Bony factors help in locking the knee. Locking occurs during the terminal parts of extension of the knee joint. Unlocking is the opposite action which is done by the muscle popliteus. Unlocking is the mechanism by which the femoral condyles rotate laterally on a fixed fibia during the initial part of flexion of the knee. Now we will see how locking occurs. As the knee joint goes from flexion into extension, the femur rotates medially on a fixed tibia and this medial rotation occurs at the terminal end of extension and this is what is called as locking of the knee joint. The opposite action is unlocking of the knee joint which is conducted by the muscle popliteus. During the initial part of the flexion of the knee, the popliteus first rotates the lower end of the femur laterally before flexion can occur. So the first action is locking which is the medial rotation of the femoral condyles on a fixed tibia. The opposite action of the lateral rotation of the femoral condyles on a fixed tibia is called as unlocking and this is conducted by the muscle which is popliteus. This is a picture showing the various stages of extension and locking of the knee joint. Stage 1 includes the anterior roll of the condyles, stage 2 includes a spinning of the condyles and stage 3 of extension is the phase of locking in which there is an axial rotation that is the medial rotation of the femoral condyles around the anterior cruciate ligament. All the ligaments are taut in the hyperextended and locked position of the knee. In the position of locking, the menisci get compressed. Let us now have a look at the various movements which are possible at the knee joint. The movements of flexion, the principal muscles which cause flexion include the hamstrings that is the biceps femoris, the semitendinosus and the semimembranosus. The accessory muscles which cause flexion at the knee joint include gracilis, sartorius, popliteus and gastronomius. The ham part of adductor mag magnus also helps in flexion. The main extensors of the knee joint include the quadriceps femoris assisted by the tensor fascia lata. Medial rotation is accomplished by semitendinosus assisted by sartorius and gracilis. Lateral rotation, the only muscle which principally brings about lateral rotation is popliteus and biceps femoris also assists in the lateral rotation at the knee joint. Now let us have a quick review of what we have studied so far about the knee joint. We, stud we studied earlier in the lesson about the articulating bones which are the lower condyles of the femur and the upper condyles of the tibia. We have seen the classification of the joint and we classified the knee joint as a complex bicondylar joint and it can also be call called as a modified hinge joint. We have seen the attachments of the capsule and the synovial membrane. We have seen the various extrinsic ligaments which include the ligamentum patellae, the medial and the lateral collateral ligaments, the oblique popliteal ligament and the arcuate ligament. We have seen and studied the intrinsic ligaments which essentially include the cruciate ligaments, the menisci, the coronary ligaments, the transverse ligament and the meniscofemoral ligaments. We have also studied the relations of the knee joint, the blood supply and the arterial anastomosis around the knee joint. We have also studied the nerve supply and the various muscles and the movements which they cause on the knee, on the knee joint. Now let's go to the applied anatomy aspect. In this part, we will be studying about the Q angle or the quadriceps angle. We will be uh, studying the various meniscal injuries which happen during a course of sports injuries. 
we will be studying about an uh, entity called as the unhappy triad of injuries, the drawer sign, collateral ligament injuries, bursitis, arthroscopy, osteoarthritis, and so many more. So let's start with the beginning. The Q angle is the angle which is formed between the long axis of the thigh and the line of gravity. If you see in this particular picture, this is the line which is extending from the anterior superior iliac spine to the center point of the patella. And this is the line of gravity, that, that, that is the line of weight transmission, which starts from the head of the femur and goes vertically downwards through the patella and into the foot. The angle which is passed formed between these two forms what is called as the quadriceps angle and the normal angle is between 11 to 14 degrees. A decreased Q angle results in what is called as genu verum or bow legs. An increased Q angle results in what is called as genu valgum or the knock knees. Injuries to the menisci are fairly common in sports and the mechanism of injury is usually a forced rotation and abduction in a flexed knee with the, with the foot fixed on the ground. This most commonly occurs in football, rugby and basketball injuries and the medial meniscus is 20 times more frequently injured as compared to the lateral meniscus because of two particular reasons. The first reason being it is fixed to the deep part of the medial collateral ligament and the second part being the medial meniscus is less mobile as compared to the lateral meniscus. Various kinds of tears occur in the meniscus and the diagnosis is usually done through uh, magnetic resonance imaging or through arthroscopy. Most of these meniscal injuries result in poor healing because of a poor blood supply, especially in the peripheral parts, the cartilage is replaced by fibrous tissue. Sometimes the meniscal tears are uh, treated by surgical removal, a procedure which is called as meniscectomy to allow partial regrowth. These are the various kinds of meniscal tears which can happen. This is an example of a vertical tear. This is an example of a transverse tear. This is a peripheral tear. This is a typical bucket handle tear. It's a parent baked tear. And this is a flap which is usually avulsed from the center part of the meniscus. Coming to the next set of injuries, the cruciate ligaments are also injured and they are commonly associated with a tibial collateral uh, injury. The mechanism of injury to the cruciate ligaments is usually a hit on the knee from the lateral side while the foot is fixed on the ground. An anterior cruciate ligament injury also results from a sudden and severe hyperextension at the knee and it can also result as a result of the anterior dislocation of the tibia. The joint becomes unstable and it, it shows what is called as an anterior drawer sign positive. The posterior cruciate ligament is injured in an injury which results in a hit against the dashboard and results in hyperflexion of the knee. This particular kind of injury can result in two types of things happening. If there is a direct transmission of weight along the femur, usually there is a posterior dislocation of the head of the femur. If there is hyperextension at the knee joint, what it results is in an injury to the posterior cruciate ligament. And the effects of this are again similar. There is joint instability and the posterior drawer sign is positive. Drawer sign is a test which is used to determine the stability and the integrity of the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. The patient is usually asked to lie supine on the bed and his knee is flexed at 90 degrees. The examiner sits gently on the foot of the patient and pushes firmly and pulls firmly on the tibial tuberosity. An undue posterior mobility of the tibia results as a result of the tear of the posterior cruciate ligament and is called as posterior drawer sign positive. An undue anterior mobility of the tibia due to tear of the anterior cruciate ligament is called as anterior drawer sign positive. There is a variation of the drawer sign and that is called as the Lachman's test for the ACL injury. It is more or less similar to this test except that the knee is flexed only till about 20 degrees. The collateral ligaments are also injured in severe and violent sports injuries 
and the mechanism is usually a hit from the opposite side. If you see there is a hit on an extended knee on the opposite side results in a tear of the ligament on this particular aspect and the common in tibial collateral ligament close to its femoral attachment. The tibial collateral ligament as we have seen in the earlier part of the lesson is a band like structure and is relatively weaker as compared to the fibular collateral ligament and therefore is injured more often as compared to the fibula collateral ligament. The unhappy triad is a set of three injuries which occur together. This triad includes a tear of the medial collateral ligament, a tear of the medial meniscus and a tear of the anterior cruciate ligament. This injury usually results from a forcible hit on the lateral aspect of the knee with the knee in extension. This, the first thing which happens is a tear of the medial collateral ligament. Since the medial collateral ligament is firmly attached to the medial meniscus, there is a resultant medial meniscal tear and also the anterior cruciate ligament gets ruptured. The unhappy triad is an orthopedician's nightmare because there are three major injuries, injury to the collateral ligament, injury to the meniscus and injury to the cruciate ligament. It's a fairly difficult condition to treat and requires prolonged physiotherapy and rehabilitation. We have seen the various kinds of bursa which surround the knee joint. Inflammation of the bursa is called as bursitis. It results in pain and swelling over the site and causes difficulty in movements. Baker's cysts or popliteal cysts are inflammation of the popliteal bursa, which is seen on the posterior aspect of the knee. There are two or three bursitis which are common on the anterior aspect. These include the clergyman's knee, which is an inflammation of the superficial infrapatellar bursa. Inflammation of this bursa is what is called as the clergyman's knee or inflammation of the superficial infrapatellar bursa. The housemate's knee is an inflammation of the prepatellar bursa. So these are the various kinds of bursitis which occur in relation to the knee joint. MRI and arthroscopy are two diagnostic procedures which can be used to visualize the interior of the knee joint. MRI is an imaging technique which employs cross-sectional anatomy to visualize the soft tissues, ligaments and cartilages which are seen within the knee joint. Arthroscopy is a minimally invasive procedure to visualize the interior of the joint. A camera is manipulated into the joint cavity. The joint cavity is filled with saline. Trimming of the ligaments and repair of the cartilages is also possible in addition to visualizing the various cruciate ligaments, the menisci and other ligaments within the knee joint. These are the various arthroscopic portals which can be used to introduce a small camera into the cavity of the knee joint. The most preferred sites are the anterolateral portal and the anteromedial portal. In addition, the superolateral portal, the superomedial portal, the midpatellar portal are also commonly employed to introduce a camera into the joint cavity. Finally, osteoarthritis, all weight bearing joints are prone to osteoarthritis, which essentially involves erosion of the joint cartilage. Usually there is an abnormal force which is transmitted onto a normal cartilage or a normal force which is transmitted onto an abnormal cartilage over extended periods of time results in osteoarthritis. The condition usually manifests as reduction in joint space, joint sclerosis which is destruction of the joint architecture presence of osteophytes which are small spicules of bone which develop within the joint and formation of bone cysts. Treatment of osteoarthritis in the earlier stages include lifestyle changes and simple analgesia. In advanced stages of osteoarthritis when the joint space has substantially reduced and when there is extensive joint sclerosis, total knee replacement is the choice of therapy where the replacement of femoral condyles is done with a metal prosthesis and there is the replacement of the tibial plateau with an artificial prosthesis. Finally, the last thing about the knee joint is occasionally there can be dislocation of the patella and the patella tends to dislocate laterally because of the pull of the quadriceps femoris. 
Fracture patella is also known to occur in injuries which, in which there is a direct blow onto the patella and patellectomy is the treatment of choice. So with this, we come to the end of the lesson on the knee joint. Thank you very much.